Please join me in the responsive call to worship. We gather here. to wonder at the mystery that gave us birth. And to listen for the wisdom that guides us. In the quietness of this moment. O oh God, you are forever faithful. You have created and redeemed and sustained us, kept us to this very hour. You have never left us nor forsaken us. You have granted to us this beautiful day, in this beautiful space, amidst your beautiful people filled with your beautiful love. Our cup does indeed overflow. And in such gratitude we have come and as you have promised, you do meet us here. And even this morning, you dare to call us to go, to stay, to listen, to share, to give, to rise to the high calling of laying down our lives, to be whatever it is for us to be your people for the living of this day. Still, we struggle to hear such a call for all sorts of reasons. There are so many competing voices. We feel unworthy, unqualified. But break through, O oh God, even now. Help us to hear your voice above all others. And help us to respond as the children of God you have made us to be. This we ask in the name of Christ our Lord, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. It's my privilege to welcome you here to River Road Church Baptist on this beautiful Sabbath day. It's my joy to welcome you to worship. If you are a member or a faithful attender, we thank you for that faithfulness. If you are a visitor, a guest amongst us, we are especially honored by your presence here with us this morning. We celebrate the fact that you got up and came to the corner of River and Ridge to share your praise with God alongside ours. If you are a guest, we would appreciate that if you would take just a moment and please sign the Maroon Registry books as they're passed along so that we might extend that welcome even beyond this particular service. At the conclusion of this services, our ministers will be at the doors. We'd love the opportunity to greet you at that time. In addition, we have a reception in our fellowship hall, uh, which is immediately to your right as you exit this sanctuary, and we would love for you to join us there at the conclusion of the service. We are glad that you are here. We have numerous opportunities to be involved in the ongoing life of the congregation coming up very shortly. This very evening, we'll be beginning a Bible study on the humanity of Jesus at 6 o'clock in the assembly room, led by Dr. Tom Graves, Dr. Bill Tuck, and the Reverend Anna Miller. And we encourage you to be in attendance for that very worthy study. On Wednesday evening, we continue, of course, with our regular programming of Thoughtful Faith Community for All Ages. For our adults, we have a special study on the grace of Les Mis in the assembly room that we'll be meeting at 6.15. Uh, this particular week, the Reverend Andrew Terry, the son of Roy and Jane Terry, and the rector at St. Peter's Episcopal Church here in town will be leading us. Um, there is no finer sight to a minister than having to move in extra chairs for an assembly. And we sort of had to do that this Wednesday. If we have to move the meeting, we will figure it out. But we encourage you to come for this wonderful opportunity.
You will also note on your bulletin that on Saturday, March 14th, from 9 to 11 a.m., the Fellowship Hall will be having our Rise Against Hunger meal packing event. You will find information there. It's a very worthy opportunity, an excellent time for families to come together in a service project. We do ask that you go to the website if you can and register your family for this event. And then you will notice we have two opportunities in the E. Carl Freeman concert series coming up, harpsichord recital on Sunday, March 15th, and an organ recital on Sunday, March 29th. You can find more information is there available in the bulletin as well. You can also get register for free tickets at our website as well. One final announcement. In light of the coronavirus, which is affecting all of our world at this time, we have no official policy to announce to you at this particular moment other than the following. We encourage you to wash your hands often and well. We also encourage you to take advantage of the hand sanitizers that you'll find throughout the building, some of which are in the narthex also. And as you pass through the receiving lines with ministers, we will respond to you as you would wish us to respond to you. But we will let you take the lead. If you would like for us to shake your hand, please extend your hand. If you'd like a fist bump, we will fist bump you back. If you would like an elbow, we will elbow you. If you would like to wave, we will wave. <laughs> Daniel said, if you would like to make a sign of blessing of the cross across your clergy, we will gladly receive that and write back at you. However you would like for us to respond to you at this time is how we will respond to you. As things develop and if we have a need for a further more in-depth policy, we will let you know. We are the people of God who have gathered in this place to worship, of God, worship God. So let us continue to do that in faithfulness. A reading from the book of Psalms, chapter 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. The word of the Lord. A reading from Genesis, chapter 12, verses 1 through 4a. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house 
to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. The word of the Lord. Join me in the call to prayer. Grant, O oh God, that the prayers we offer may be your channel for new and abundant life, not only hoped for, but worked for, 
through faith, word, and deed. Bring our prayers to life this and every day. Living God, we seek your presence now. Our minds cannot understand you, yet our hearts cry out for a living relationship with you. Our eyes cannot see you, yet without you there would be nothing to see. Our faith cannot grasp you, yet in you we live and move and have our being. Our way ahead into this week is hidden from us, but we trust that you have prepared a way through for us. Renew our vision of the eternal truths in the light of which our day-to-day lives must be lived. Open our eyes to see your presence in the simple, simple, simple glories of everyday things. Light up our relationships with other people by living world of love in Jesus. Help us so we can see where we went wrong in the past, that we shall be able to make the changes needed going forward. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Pray with me. Generous God, our guide on the journey, as we continue in worship by offering our gifts in response to your goodness, we can't imagine where we would be without your guiding our path, sometimes before us, sometimes beside us, sometimes behind us, nudging us in the direction of the work that you would have for us. As you have watched over and cared for your creation, so we acknowledge in our giving that you are calling us to do the same. We surrender our treasure, knowing that our hearts will follow. We pray in the name of the one whose heart was fully in tune with yours, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
It was mid-afternoon on a late spring day. It was a beautiful day. Abram was in his backyard lounge chair, sipping some lemonade, looking out over his freshly mown lawn. Now, Sarah thought Abe shouldn't be cutting the grass anymore. He was 75, after all. They could afford a lawn service, but, but Abe couldn't bring himself to do it. Now he enjoyed pushing the mower and loved the smell of cut grass. For Abram, life was good. He'd had a successful and fulfilling career, and even though they didn't have any children, he'd enjoyed a long and happy marriage to Sarah. Sarah was inside at the kitchen table, leafing through a brochure of one of those senior communities down south. Looked awful tempting. Golf course, swimming pool, shuffleboard and bridge, and most importantly, all outside maintenance taken care of. Maybe this was the year, she thought. Maybe this was the year they'd actually do it. Pound a for sale sign in the front yard and get ready to enjoy their golden years. And then, sitting in his lawn chair with his lemonade, Abram hears it. He hears God's voice. Go. That's all God says. Just go. God doesn't say exactly where he should go. Only that God will show him. And something about the way God says it tells Abe that we're not talking about sunny Florida. Now, if you're like me, when you read this story, when you get to this part, it makes you a little nervous. Maybe it's the lack of details. Maybe it's the feeling that that not everything is under our control. Maybe it's because sometimes when God's call comes, God requires something of us not of our own choosing. And that just might change our lives forever. And if you're like me, that scares you beyond belief. Now don't get me wrong. There are times when we want God to intervene, like when we're in trouble or when we're at the end of our rope. But the rest of the time, well, most of us prefer that God would just leave us alone. Only our God will never leave us alone. Our God searches for us until God finds us and then calls us out of our comfortable lives, and handing us our suitcases, God says, get up. We're going on a journey. So that's what God says to Abram and Sarah. Let's go. And just in case Abram doesn't understand the radical nature of this move, God spells out exactly what they will be leaving behind. God says, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house. In other words, leave behind your nation, your family, the very home in which you have lived all of your life and plan to die. Pick up and move to another place. And when you have done this, God says, I will bless you. We've romanticized it, I know, but 
But this is scary, isn't it? Not only that, it's risky business. This packing up and moving out to God knows where. But here, almost at the beginning of Scripture, at the beginning almost of the entire biblical story, we are told this is what real faith looks like. Real faith is responding when God calls. Friends, do you know the name Virginia Durr? I didn't know that name until a couple weeks ago. I happened to be reading about her, and in case you didn't know who she was, like I didn't, let me tell you a little bit about her. Virginia was a student at Wellesley College in 1922. When she got there, Virginia found out that Wesley had what they called a rotating tables policy. That is, every day in the cafeteria, you were required to eat meals with random groups of fellow students. And then she found out that this policy, among others, included African Americans. She would be required to eat with African Americans, and this was 1922, remember. Well, Virginia was the daughter of a prominent, white, old money Presbyterian family from Union Springs, Alabama. She protested to the dean, saying she wasn't going to share a meal with a black person. She was told she could either abide by the policy or leave. Those were her choices. Virginia decided to stay, albeit reluctantly. And yes, she shared a few meals with some African Americans on campus. And something changed within her. Fast forward to December 1955. Rosa Parks was arrested and jailed in Montgomery, Alabama for refusing to give up her seat on the bus to a white man. Shortly thereafter, Rosa Parks was released from jail only after her bail was posted, paid in full by a woman named Virginia Durr. Sometimes that's how it starts, just with a whisper. I want you to stay here, eat a meal together, and I will bless you. Church following Jesus is a risky business, because once you answer that call, everything will change. Happened to be reading last week also about an interview that Archbishop of South Africa Desmond Tutu gave to the BBC some years ago. He was asked if he could identify the one defining moment in his life. To look back over his entire life, could he identify one key moment? Tutu thought about it for a while, and then he began to speak about a day when he was just nine years old. He and his mother were walking down the street. A tall white man dressed in a black suit came towards them, and remember this was the days of apartheid South Africa. When a black person or a white person, if they were meeting along a sidewalk or footpath, the black person was expected to step into the gutter and allow the white person to pass. But this day, before the young Tutu and his mother could step off the sidewalk into the gutter, while a white man was coming their way, 
this white man hopped into the gutter himself. And as they passed, he tipped his hat in a gesture of respect. Tutu said, that one moment changed my life. The reporter said, that, that one moment when you were nine years old? Tutu said, you see, that white man was named Trevor Huddleston. He was an Anglican priest. When Mama told me that Reverend Huddleston had stepped off the sidewalk because he was a man of God, Tutu said, right then and there, I heard God's call. And when Mama told me he was an Anglican priest, I decided right then and there that I wanted to be an Anglican priest too. And what's more, Tutu said, I wanted to be a man of God just like him. Friends, you never know when the call will come. David was a child when he fought with Goliath. Mary was a teenager when she carried within her own body the Savior of the world. Virginia Doerr was a college student. Desmond Tutu was nine years old. And Abram was 75. You never know where the call will come. Abram was at home. Moses was on the run after killing an Egyptian. Isaiah was in a worship service. The woman caught in adultery, well, she was caught in adultery. And you never know how the call will come. Abram heard God speak. Moses saw a burning bush. Mary was visited by an angel. Joseph had a dream. Paul had a vision. And dazzling, was blinded by a dazzling light. It's true, friends, sometimes God speaks in a whisper, other times in a shout, sometimes from a voice from within, other times through the voice of a child. And while I cannot tell you when, where, or how God's call will come to you, I can assure you, dear friends, one day it will come, if it hasn't already. And when you hear God's voice, you respond, things will never be the same. And I have to tell you, all this talk about Abram and Sarah's call to go and make a new nation and be a blessing, I think it makes me consider my own call from God. Perhaps it does that for you. makes me ask myself, what might God be calling me to do? What commitment do I need to follow through on? Is there a promise that I need to, keep, need to keep? Is there a relationship that I need to invest in or reinvest in? Is there a gift I need to offer a friend? Is there some forgiveness I need to give or receive? Is there a decision I need to make today? Why do you suppose God chose to call Abram and Sarah? What was different about them that God said, yes, these are the people I'll call? Were they righteous and upright people? like the Bible tells us Noah and his family were? Were they super spiritual people? You know, Scripture doesn't really say. So we don't know. Except that we do know. We know that God is always calling the ordinary, the less than special, the regular folk like you and me, to work together 
to usher in God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven. Sometimes this call comes to you as an individual. Sometimes it comes to us as a faith community. One of my favorite preachers is a retired pastor and seminary professor named Barbara Lundblad. She ended her career at Union Theological Seminary in New York City. She tells of a phone call that she once received from one of her former students who was pastoring an inner city church. Professor Lundblad was glad to catch up with this student, and she asked how their recent building renovation project was going. Oh, it went, it's going great, the student responded. But I have to tell you, we ran out of money before we could finish the sanctuary. Professor Lundblad bristled a little bit at this. She said, I, th I thought I had taught this student better than this. Naturally, worship is the most important thing we do together as a church. It should be our first priority. The student said, we ran out of money to finish the sanctuary, but we entirely remodeled the basement. The basement? Lumblad asked. Oh, yes, the student replied. The basement is where we have our homeless shelter. And so we were able to put in some new beds and some new kitchen equipment and really clean the place up for our guests. The previous Sunday, they had just held a dedication service for their church basement in their old and rundown sanctuary. And it was there that they praised and prayed and heard this word of God hungry and you gave me some food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the student said, we took the bread on the table and we grabbed the communion cup and we went downstairs into the basement and we broke the bread and shared the cup over the brand new beds and in the new kitchen. And that night our sanctuary still needed work, but thanks be to God our basement was full. And Christ was fed and welcomed and clothed and sheltered by his church. Friends, what is God calling you to? What is God calling us to as River Road Church? Is it a call like Abram to get up and go? Or is it a call to stay right here? To serve our neighbors, literal and otherwise, with the life-changing love of Christ? God's call comes to you and me to follow God to new places, to new obedience, to new mission activity of compassion and healing and reconciliation and rebuilding in this world. And sometimes God's call is to a deeper commitment to something that we're already doing. And yes, sometimes God's call prompts us to move from where we are to a new place. To let go of some old securities and certainties. And to hold tightly to Christ. To summon the courage to be open to his openness. To be radical in our acceptance and inclusive in our welcome. To come out from those barriers and those boundaries that we have often created for ourselves. And step into the glorious light, which is freedom in the love of Christ. No 
No, I can't say for certain how or when or where God's call will come to you. But friends, one day it will come. For each of us, one of these days. And when that call comes to you, to us, I hope we will listen. Beloved church family, as you depart from this place, do so with the blessing of God. And throughout this season of Lent, may the love of the faithful Creator, the peace of the wounded healer, and the joy of the sustaining spirit remain with you now and always.